Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to the Reluctant Agilist. I am in total fanboy mode today, and I'm really psyched because I finally worked up the courage to write to these people and ask if they would do an interview with me, and they said yes. So today's topic is going to be all about social engineering and human hacking, and I am here with two people whose last names I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, Chris and Dr. Abby, thank you for joining us. Yep. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Now, real quick, since I did just mm. call that out, could you at least both pronounce your last names for these fine people? Okay. Um, so mine is Dr. Abby Moronya or Morono, if you want to take away the, the true accent. All right. My name is Chris Hednagy. Just going to go with that. <laughs> okay. That's easy to spell. You'll be able to find them both on Amazon. So um, part of my approach to managing work, working with teams, working with people, is that a big part of it involves taking elements of social engineering and applying them to the work that I do. And so we have two experts here, and we're going to talk to them about what social engineering is, what human hacking is, if they're the same or different. And I want to kind of walk down that path. So if you're somebody who's not familiar with the topic, I hope this sparks some interest. And if you are somebody who's thinking of social engineering as a bad thing, I will, hopefully we can dissuade you of that by the end of this podcast. So um, before we jump into it, um, Dr. Ivy, would you mind telling these folks a little bit about your background and what you do? Yes. So I am a behavioral scientist and a behavior analysis. Uh, I work as the director of education for uh, Social Engineer LLC. Uh, I was originally a full-time academic. I was a professor of psychology and Chris and social engineer have pulled me into the private sector, where I have to say I have found a home. We pulled That's her out. Excellent. Saved her from <laughs> asking her. <laughs> liberated her. Yeah, <laughs> liberated her from her shackles. <laughs> cool. Thank you. And Chris? Uh, so I'm Chris Hadnagy. I uh, am the CEO of Social Engineer LLC, as well as the Innocent Lives Foundation. Um, I've been doing this for I think longer than Abby's been alive, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so I'm old. Yeah, that's right. That's one part. Uh, and uh, I've, I've seasoned. I don't know, we're seasoned. We're not seasoned. Old. I like that. Like you know, like an aged piece of beef, right? <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say about myself. That's about it. Kind of boring. Well, I don't think it's that boring. So I, I will just share a little bit of my my introduction to you. I was in a bookstore one day in a Barnes and Noble, and I looked down, and I saw one of your books, and I was like, oh my god, somebody wrote something about this. And I don't have to try to figure out what Paul Ekman's actually talking about anymore. I can actually read something that's a little more accessible. And those books, your first two books, just blew me away in terms of um, just giving me ideas that I could bring to play in my job of working with teams and working with people and trying to help them accept change or try different things or be open to stuff, or even just give me any kind of information that I need to know to be able to be successful in my job. So thank you. On Thank behalf you. of, of quite kind. people who do what I do, um, how would you define social engineering and how would you contrast it with human hacking? Yeah, I, I kind of love this question because um, when, I, when I started writing the framework, it was 2008, right? And I started writing it because I had a client that basically asked me, you know, well, how do I fix it? Like, you, you broke in. How do I fix it? And I went, I don't know. Yeah, I just was cool enough to break in. That was it, right? And he said to me, if, if I went to my auto mechanic and said, hey, what's this noise? And he went, that's the brakes. I said, can you fix it? And he went, no, I'd never go back to the auto mechanic again. And I went, that's a great analogy, man. Like, And I just felt like this horrible practitioner that only cared about doing the job and didn't know how to fix yeah. anything. I said, I got I to gotta start learning about how to fix it, right? So for me, it started reading every book I can find on human decision-making, influence, um, um, you know, anything to do with the brain, psychology, uh, nonverbals, just everything I could consume. And I then would write down little paragraphs and sticky notes in the books and say, I'm, next time I try a phishing email, I'm going to try this principle, right? I read Cialdini's Seven Principles of Influence. And I'm going to try this, right? And then it would work. And I would make another note, like, why do I think this works? Okay. That came around at, at the uh, point where the framework came out in 2009. And what I hated about the definition for social engineering was it was always like the manipulation of someone to do something bad, right? Yeah. It was always like that. And that bothered me because the, all these books I read, none of them were about getting people to do bad things. It was like convincing people to not do drugs anymore or Did saving someone from their TV. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right? It was, though, it was, and I'm like, so there has to be a good element to social engineering. So I know it's a long answer and I'm sorry for that, but I, I think the backstory was important. So I define social engineering, and we do here at the company, as any act that influences a person 
to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. Because I think when you look at SE, the intended goal of the user mm-hmm. is is what makes social engineering positive or negative. Oh, right. If I'm if I'm now speaking to you and I want this to be a great interview, so I'm going to use elements of social engineering, and I have no wish for you to do anything harmful. I don't want you to send me your credit right. card or anything when we're done. So I'm not using any of those elements to hurt you. I'm going to use social engineering to make this interview as good as I possibly can. Okay. But if my goal was to now get some information from you, so then I can hurt you later. And my, my intent is wrong. It might be yeah. the same exact skill set, but my intent changes the, the, the way that we look at the, 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 the skill. Okay. And the point of the intent is a really important distinction. When we talk about influence and manipulation, we want to put them in these two completely different camps and say, okay. no, no, influence is different than manipulation. They're completely different. But realistically, all manipulation is influence, <laughs> but not all influence is manipulation per se. The real thing that differentiates them is the intention for malintent so when you have malintent and your intention is to create psychological harm or psychological distress now we're in the realm of manipulation and it's very subjective for example if you're a salesman maybe you say my goal is to influence this sale yeah but what if you're the one that's being influenced maybe you say well no they were using manipulation so there is no clear limit and there's no clear line for what's influence and what's manipulation. Yeah. But if you go in with the intent to cause distress or psychological okay. harm, then guaranteed that is manipulation. Okay. So and, it's sort of like a knife. You can use it for good things or bad things. Yes. And okay. I think that's why we, we, we can so easily balance, at least in our field, that what we're doing, we are deceiving people, like for my mm-hmm. job every day. But I'm not doing it with the intent of stealing something from them or hurting them or even bringing shame and embarrassment to them. I'm doing it with the intent of helping them be more secure. So when the real bad guys come, they're prepared. And you compare that almost like a boxing instructor. Yeah. He's going to punch you in the face at some point, but he's not doing it's it to job. try to kill you. Right? <laughs> he's not trying to kill you. He's trying to teach you. Here's how you defend when someone goes to punch you in the face. Okay. So, so you should explain what your regular part that part of your job is. They may not know. Yeah, that's a good question, too. I think I, sh- I should have done that in the beginning. So um, our company, Social Engineer LLC, we get hired by companies to basically audit their security infrastructure, but we focus on the human side of it. So the humans, you know, you can you can put firewalls and all the technology that most companies have, and you probably heard those words before, but a human is running every one of those things. So what attackers have found out is, wow, this guy spent a million dollars on his technology. That's really impenetrable. I can't get through that. But if I can convince Joe, the IT guy, to put this USB key in, all those million dollar defenses mean nothing. Mm-hmm. So they started focusing on the humans running the technology. So people like us are kind of like uh, doctors who do physicals. We come in and we do all this test and audits and we, we test all these little pieces of, of people and technology and areas and we see if there's a vulnerability somewhere. And then when we do, we come back to the company and say, hey, we found something. Now we have to fix it. And then okay. we have to yeah. fix it. You can have the most malicious link possible and you can have the most advanced malware. But unless a human being opens the doors, that's yeah. in. unless yeah. they click that link, unless they click that text. So we always say, at social engineer, your security network can either be your biggest downfall or your greatest superpower. When you train your human security network effectively, they can work for you so effectively. But if you don't train the human security network and you just focus on the technical, yeah. there's a huge Please. limitation. Okay. So I want to I want to try to connect this for the folks that are listening in case it wasn't they, they didn't see the threat. What we do, what I do, people like me do, whether it's traditional projects or agile projects, I am trying to get people to change their behavior at work. I'm trying to get them to adopt different practices or ask questions they might not feel inclined to ask themselves about how things are working. And that is all about understanding people and how to motivate them to to look at this stuff or to consider this stuff or to do this thing, which is exactly what you're talking about, right? Why would you not want to use social engineering yeah. skills in that? When you think about it, if I have an employee and I don't have one named Bob, so I can use if I have an employee named Bob here and Bob's a trouble, right? He's he's not doing the job. He doesn't pull his weight. He's not he's not working the hours I'm paying him. I can come in and be like, hey listen, I'm your boss. You either do this or you get fired. That's one option. Or yeah. I can look at Bob's communication profile, figure out you know, this has this change from when I hired him. Is there something going on in his life? And then have a conversation. Hey, Bob, what's going on, man? Everything okay? Because it seemed like, you know, production's really down lately. Like, is there something I can help you with? Find yeah. out if there's a reason for it. Is he disgruntled? Is he having problems at home? 
maybe there's a reason that I can now understand and help him as opposed to just coming in and putting my foot on his throat. That's aspects of social engineering, but we're doing yeah. it in a way that's making people better. Yeah. And that's why the, the psychology is so important because anytime you're dealing with humans, psychology is important. And when people are not behaving effectively, we could just say, yeah, they're lazy. They don't have the competence or maybe they have the competence, but they have self-limiting beliefs. Mm. They yeah. don't believe in themselves. And then we can understand why. Because when people don't have belief in themselves and they think, oh, I'm not competent enough, or we have the dreaded imposter syndrome, which we all experience, research has shown men and women equally experience it, we all do. When we have that and when we have these limiting beliefs, if we say I'm not competent, when an opportunity arises yeah. to take a risk to work on a project to do something to show competence we go oh well i don't have the ability so i don't so then what happens is we get in this cycle where because we don't take the opportunity we don't learn we don't self reinforcing we don't gain the competence yeah. yes it's it's a reinforcing self-fulfilling prophecy where we get stuck in this cycle we don't grow because we don't take it when we as a leader can recognize that yeah. and we understand the person and we try and help them, we can try and get to the root of that self-limiting belief or we can provide them awareness of their behavior. And then we can tackle the behavior. Okay. And we can start providing opportunity. For example, if you are a woman in the workplace, maybe that you do have equal opportunity, but maybe you don't think that you do. So you don't wield so it. Say you think because I'm a woman or because I'm this age or because of this, I'm not going to be provided the opportunity. So you don't go for it. You don't get it. And then you go, well, because I'm a woman because I'm this age. Yeah. And it reinforces that. But as a leader, if you're aware of that and you have those conversations and have open conversations and say this is available to everyone, if you have any concerns, come to me privately. They express that. They get the opportunity to go for it. And they've spoken their mind and they do great. You know, so some of the times it's us that limits our own opportunities and yeah. us that holds back our own behaviors because we don't feel like we can do it even though we can. Okay. So you know, I want to give you an example of this from the, from our work because I think this is a really powerful lesson. Uh, we were breaking into a building, one of our client's buildings, and the security guard was asleep, just asleep okay. at her desk. And I mean, asleep to the point of that, like we went to the truck day, bay, we, we brought a ladder back right past her. We used a ladder to break in over another wall. She never woke up, right? Now, that's obviously a massive security problem. But here I am, I'm about to turn, the, I have to turn this woman in, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking she's going to get fired. Yeah. Like, as, as bad as I feel that she was sleeping, I'm like, I'm about to wreck someone's life. So when I turned her in, what I told my point of contact was, hey, listen, I don't know why, but she must, something must have been happening in her life because, I mean, we were, we were, we had a metal ladder that we carried right past her. There was like five or six of us making all sorts of noise, trying to climb through a roof and she never woke up. So maybe before you just go in and like kick her out, find out if there's something else. And they listened. They actually didn't fire her. They found out there were some problems and the, the shift was bad. So they gave her a different shift. Wow. And, and, yeah. So I'm that's like, great. I, I mean, that's, wonder about that in your books. Like, how many people get fired when you go? No, no. So we have this really big policy um, that we 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 tell our clients all of this is that we we don't want to be the company that that people are afraid of if we come to work for you because you're going to fire people. Okay. What we want is education. Now, if we find a real threat, yeah, right, we found people downloading pornography on company network or um, downloading software, mal, you know, downloading like um, um, what do they call it? Like uh, you know, like movies and music and stuff. Yeah. That brings viruses to your network. So if someone's doing that on your network, they're a threat. Right? I don't mind. If you need to get rid of them, that's fine. But if someone falls for one of our tests, they're human. That's it. Yeah. And if you fire them and you, you hire the next human, guess what? They're going to fall for that test. So you're going to be in a nonstop turnstile of people if that's your, if that's your motive of op, op, motive operandi is just to fire people when they fail. Yeah. So, but in some cases, like the sleeping guard, I was shocked that they actually didn't fire her. But it showed me that, wow, there's a very a, main way to treat somebody. Yes, yeah. it yeah. is. And it was a nice way to kind of present it to them. And then they listened. And then they were like, yeah, maybe there is. And once you find out, like, hey, it's from problems at home or whatever, it's it, your compassion kicks in. Yeah. And you're like, well, can we, give her, can we give her a different job that maybe will make it easier for her life and then see. And then if she okay. fails there, then it's like, okay, look, I've tried everything. 
giving right. him a shot. Yeah. I'm giving you another shot and you're still falling. Like I can't, there's nothing more I can do. Sorry. You have to take responsibility at some point. Right. But okay. at least that first step using that empathy and compassion, it can really make a yeah. huge difference. Cool. Yep. And so, empathy is one of our core passions at social engineering because it's so important, especially when you're on a job, you just think, okay, this is a target. This is, you know, a bystander. This mark, is that. Yeah. You, just, you kind of dehumanize people. And we do it all the time. And when we say you are the mark, you are the target, you have dehumanized them. So now you're more likely to act in a way that is unethical. You might put them in some harm without intention to because you've dehumanized them. When you have empathy and you remind yourself, this is a person with emotions, they have a family, they have their own world going on. They're not just a target. They are a person and they are involved in this. It really helps you make sure that you craft the pretext and craft Mm -hmm. the attack carefully with empathy so i want to i appreciate all of that and i want to turn it a little bit back to something you said a few minutes ago and it's also a generational question too because i know that chris and i believe you and i are from the same generation first album was oh geez um you mean rock album yeah would have been uh def leopard Okay, mine was Foreigner 4. So we're in the same... Okay, no, but say, yeah, yeah, so okay. I had Foreigner. My brother's was Air Supply, but I, I was too soft for me, so I didn't yeah. like that. So it was like Iron Maiden or Judas Priest, you know, something like that. Okay, so um, imposter syndrome is, is always an interesting topic to me, and I feel like a big part of mm-hmm. me trying to get more skillful with some of this stuff has been trying to practice it, which meant I had to work through the fact that I am an introvert who's very uncomfortable in certain mm-hmm. situations, and I had to push past that. So the first, the generational question is, I don't remember imposter syndrome being a thing when I was younger. It was just like, get over it for Gen X. Ah, I just had to fun through it. But then now we have, we have it as a called out thing. Is that? Yeah. So there's research done um, on things like this about the generational differences with how we handle things like how we handle criticism, Mm -hmm. how we feel comfortable in the workplace and imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a universal human experience. Oh, it is. But it's always been a universal human experience. The difference is, as the generations have changed and the culture has changed, we're more open about yeah. it. So, and this is why we still see a difference with men and women too. So we know that men and women both equally experience imposter syndrome. But what we do see is the way that it's expressed is okay. different. Okay, okay. Just like the different generations experience imposter syndrome, but the way that it's handled and expressed is different. So, for example, women are more likely to say, you know, I feel anxious, I feel stressed, and are more likely to be open about it. They're more likely to say, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I feel like I have imposter syndrome, just like the younger generation are also. Okay. But males are less likely to be open about how they feel, and the way they express it is typically overcompensation. Perfect. So they're more likely to overcompensate by being a little bit more a little controlling, extra. a little bit yeah. more egotistical, trying to be really dominant yeah. in the workplace to be like, because I feel like an imposter, I'm going to prove that I'm not an imposter. Perfect. So the different strategies are there, and that's why it looks like it's felt differently. Yeah. But it isn't. It's because our internal environment is is so unique to us, but we all have this shared human experience. Yeah. But then we get to choose how we express that. Perfect. So the behaviors are different. And, you okay. know, when we were kids, we didn't have something called autism. But I guarantee you, looking That's at it now, that I knew autistic kids in school. Yeah. Right? Looking at it now. But we didn't have it because it wasn't diagnosed. It wasn't figured out yet. Yeah. Um, now, now we have a word for it. Right? So I, I do remember feeling imposter syndrome in my younger yeah, years but, but, right? but it didn't have a name and, and that's, have a name. That, that's what i was kind of because it didn't have a label you're right most of the time the answer was well i just gotta suck it up and do right. it right right so because there's no label to it my way of trying to hack myself with like public speaking understanding that i was anxious and incredibly uncomfortable and felt like i was going to completely make a just career limiting disaster of myself tried to pretend that I was me five years from now and would go out and do that. So overcompensating by pretending, playing the part of me in the future. Um, I'm imagining that when you're doing this stuff, when you're trying to break into a building or whatever, you've got to put on some kind of persona. You've got to pretend to be something you're not. That's got to be a, a thing you have to 
work out. It's got to be hard to do that, I would think. Do we call it a pretext? So pretext okay. being the act that we're going to put on, and that involves everything. It could be our, our outfit, the tools we have, the words we'll use that will prove to the person that we are who we say we are. And I heard this great speech recently where the person said, um, feel the emotion, but fake the action. Feel the emotion, fake the behavior. Fake the behavior. That was Abby's speech. It was my speech. <laughs> and uh, and I think that's a really great way of of, of putting it because you know we're, I, I still get afraid. I mean, I'm yeah. breaking into a building and uh, recently, and these guys are all armed with AR-15s. You'd be a fool to not be afraid, yeah. right? I mean, I don't <laughs> want to get shot, right? Yeah. So, like so, I, to, to walk in and act like I'm not afraid would be the dumbest thing on earth. That's that's going to get everyone killed. So I am afraid, but. I still got to do the pretext. I still got to do the act. Yeah. So I, and what I, what I tell people, uh, my team is when you can't get rid of an emotion, work it into your pretext. Right. So oh, if wow, I'm afraid, okay. yeah. So if Use I'm it. afraid, right. And people might see fear. I don't want them to see fear. So I just make it like, Oh man, I'm so stressed out because yeah. I had an argument with my wife before I left and now she's mad and I'm supposed to bring home flowers. It's so late. I don't think I'm going to get to the flower store on time. And you know, I started a conversation. Like, now when they see stress or fear, they were going to this argument I had with my wife and not because this guy's sketchy. Yeah. Right. right. So, I, I, so you can do the same thing in your speech. It's like, just, you know, just, I, I mean, I don't have a quick example, but you know, you, you, you don't try to submerge the emotion uh -huh. because that, that doesn't work. We're humans. And if you okay. do that, it's going to come out eventually. So you open your body language or that's whatever. It. Somewhere. And that's a really important point. Do it. That feel the emotion, fake the behavior. Because that fake it till you make it is just about behavior. Go and do it. That feel the emotion is so important. Because we need to understand why we feel it. Because unless we understand our emotions, we cannot remedy them. And they're going to continue to be a problem. Okay. We don't just want to keep treating the symptoms. We don't just want to keep having to fake it. We yeah. want to fake it on the journey to eventually making it. So when you feel that imposter syndrome, when you feel those negative emotions, sit with them, try and understand where they're coming from, listen to them. And people always say to me, how do I become more self-aware? And I say, it's easy, but I guarantee you don't really want to. Because <laughs> most people say, I really want to be self-aware. I really want to understand myself. And I say, do you? Or do you just want a finished product? Do you just want the easy way out? Do you just want to be Or just happy? be told like, it's yeah. out, buddy. Because the journey to getting to that point, that growth is so uncomfortable. Yeah. It is uncomfortable and it is painful because when we're nervous around people, and when we feel like we're not good enough, there's a reason. And the reason usually lies in our past or, you know, the judgment of others, something. There is a reason for it and it's uncomfortable. Maybe we behaved in a way we didn't like and we have to sit with that and we're trying to hide that. It's uncomfortable to look at and reflect on. Yeah. But that's the work that we have to do in private if we eventually want to get to that point that we don't have to keep faking it. So you do you know, have to we, know yourself to be able to do this with other people. You have to have. Yes, okay. to a degree. I mean, it's a journey. And I, I think knowing yourself is a really difficult thing to do. And you can still be an amazing social engineer and not have reached that point. But the point is, as long as you're working towards that, as long as you're trying to seek yourself, as long as you're still making that choice to, okay, I feel my emotions, I'm not going to deny them and push them down. Yeah. I'm going to try and register them. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to fake the behavior. Okay. I'm going to go and do the job. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by them because we need to feel them. Yeah. But we need to not allow them to control us. Not, okay. So it is a difficult balance. And that's why it's so hard to be self-aware because it's not it's not easy and it's yeah. not comfortable. But when you get to that point, the amount that you can do because you're not holding yourself back is amazing. Okay. So how would – maybe you can give an example. I'm interested in talking about how somebody who studies this, who develops that – heightened sense of self-awareness and is, can look at the, the light and the dark parts of themselves um, and then learn to see things in others. How could I use that to be a better servant leader to my team, to the people I work with, to my family members? Like, it, how can I use it for good? So, so I always... Oh. You want to go first, Debbie? Yeah, so I always try and say, look beneath the surface. Okay. So when something presents itself, it's rarely ever what it seems. Um, Chris and I did a, an interesting podcast a while ago on conspiracy theories. And I, I think this is a great example. You know, we, we see people that um, 
they look like they're conspiracy theorists. They're saying all these crazy things. And we go, oh my gosh, they are crazy. They're out of their mind. But often a conspiracy theory is an escape from reality. Okay. Sometimes someone has gone through something so difficult, they don't know how to cope. And they need to put those emotions somewhere. So they throw them into a conspiracy because now that's what their life is it's about. They don't have to do exactly. It becomes a safe place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you see someone doing that, what they really need is support. And when you say okay. they need help and they don't need help, like, you know, you're crazy, you need help. It's like they actually need help. So when you see someone behaving badly, or maybe you see someone really aggressive or you see someone that is just rude or in a bad mood, don't just label it the surface level of, wow, what a miserable person. Yeah. Or, you know, wow, what a bad behavior. Try and look beneath the surface and try and ask if they need something. You know, don't be patronizing like, you know, do you need help? <laughs> <laughs> try and provide a hand. Try and show them that you're not being judged. They're a human being. To we all have stories. We all have stuff going exactly. on. I'll give you a personal example. Um, <clears throat> so learning about my communication style has helped me to see why certain people might find it difficult at times because I'm very direct and I'm very direct. And um, I'm the kind of person that I'd rather if someone told me, here's what you need to fix in your work. Yeah. As opposed to telling me it's great and leaving something wrong. Okay. Now, I want them to be polite. I don't want them. I don't, I don't want people to come and go, Hey, you're stupid. Fix this. I don't want impoliteness. Right. But I don't mind if someone comes up like in my first book and says, and I really think you messed up on a few things there. Yeah. Oh, really? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what that is about, right? I appreciate that more. So I tend to also communicate with people that way. Well, not everybody likes that. Some people need a, a softer touch to approach yeah. that that method. So learning that about myself has helped myself um, has helped me to to be able to temper that and realize that sometimes when I'm having a conversation with someone. And it's going the wrong way. I have to quickly do analyzation and go, oh, that's my fault, not their fault. Mm. Kind of, I kind of thought what was coming out was a waterfall, but it was like a fire hydrant. Yeah. You know? So and it was like, and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. This, I, I understand it. I take a step back. Right. And um, a, a, a great example of this, it was uh, right at the beginning of COVID when we were all still going out a little bit, we were wearing masks. I had this mask that was the, the, the face of the Hulk, right? And it had the teeth. It's like, and it was just yeah, angry. Yeah. And I'm wearing a hat and I'm, you know, I got a hoodie on and I got this mask. So you can't basically see anything. Right. I thought it was funny because that Hulk's my favorite character. Right. So um, I'm in this grocery store and I'm looking down at my phone. My wife gave me a list and I round this corner and there's this like woman, she's probably like five foot one. And I almost just run her over. And she looks up and she's like, what's up with you? You jerk. Why don't you stop being so angry and running people over? She got mad at me. And I'm like, oh, smash. So, you know, I'm like, so smart. Like I didn't. And I'm like, why did she think I was angry? And I'm sitting there in the next aisle going to myself, like, well, I wasn't even angry. I didn't even, I didn't even get mad at her. I apologized right away and said, oh my gosh, I'm like a bull in a China shop. Like everything, I tried to apologize. And then I was like, oh, it's this, right? Oh, it's, it's, it, well, all she saw was anger. So when you understand like how you're coming off to people, yeah. when you understand your nonverbals, when you understand your communication style, you have a choice at that point. Now I could have chosen to say, I'm going to keep wearing this, screw those people. But I went home and I went, I'm not wearing this again, because if people are going to view me as being angry, if I get pulled over, yeah. the cop comes up to the, the car and he thinks I'm angry, this is going to change my whole interaction with this person. So I don't want people thinking I'm angry. So I'm like, I'm going to go put on a different mask, one that doesn't have any faces on it. So that okay. way people don't, you know, they, they don't they'll have to just look at my face to see the emotion, not a mask. Right. And, and I think that's an important point when you're talking about how to use this for good. Yeah. Because you do have to understand yourself to an extent. Otherwise, how do you make change? And you need so, to be able to make change that way. What I think is awesome about that example is that we're all wearing masks all the time. And I think yeah. some masks we put on, you know, for hopefully for the benefit of everyone around. But sometimes you just put on a mask for whatever reason. Um, even becoming more aware of how we're doing that, you know, yeah. it doesn't have to physically be a Hulk mask. It could be anything. Sure. And, and if that mask is hard for some people to take, Right. Like when um, this was a this was like a big discussion in the company years ago, when I when things get stressful, I get very task focused. And it's not that I don't care about people. I really do. I love my team and I care about them greatly. But when things are stressful, it's like I don't care about how tired you are, your feelings. We're going to finish this task. And sometimes people are just like they're not able to work. And it's not I'm not saying they're weak. I'm just like they're not able to work at the same level I'm able to work. 
So it's almost like it's it's uh, oppressive or, or hard to say to people, like, no, yeah. we got to get this done. We go to this conference and we're setting up the room. And like, I'll go an 18 hour day setting this room up. And, you know, they're like, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm like, yeah, but it's also your we're company done. too. That, ma- yes. that affects it as yeah. well. But, but understanding that and stepping back and going, okay, that's me. These people have some, they have some other needs. Like I can get more out of them if I fulfill their needs. Give them water, food, food. food. Yeah. <laughs> Take a break. Right. Like, you know, instead of running them to the ground, you know, yeah. give them some things that they need. And now all of a sudden everyone's happy and they want to do the job. Right. So it's just, it's kind of learning those things. And then you have to be willing to see where your flaws are and then change. Okay. So when I first encountered your books, Chris, the, the, there's a lot of practices in there. And some of them I was able to figure out ways to try out at work. Some of it was testing myself. Some of it was testing the people around me. But the psychology aspect, Dr. Abbey, that you bring to it, it's like it's like the, the bacon that goes on the burger for me. It's like the thing that makes it work. Very American analogy. <laughs> it's the chips that go with the fish. How's that? <laughs> so much better. Um, you know what? They like bacon in the UK. I, I I was just there. They love bacon in the UK. And they love American bacon. They call it streaky bacon. They love it. Okay. So don't let her fool you. We <laughs> love to do that to us Americans. <laughs> so how do I... I mean, I can practice the moves mm-hmm. of getting people to do stuff, learning to like understand what this hand gesture means or where their feet are pointing and stuff. But understanding things at a psychological level, if I'm just a lay person, like how would I go about deepening my, my spider sense there? This is a question I love because I have such strong opinions on this. Oh, good. I'll try and keep this as the short wrong as I question. The wrong yeah. question, Dave. So, Seeking, to go, right? you know, seeking credible information is so important. And especially when it comes to psychology, because I don't know how many posts I have seen that goes, psychology says, and then it gives this outrageous comment. And everyone's like, wow, I didn't know this. And I'm like, you didn't know it because it's not true. And I <laughs> it's see on the so, internet. I, well, it's on the psychology said it. So yes. maybe it is true. It's on and TikTok. And I see this people, right? th- that's the thing. I see people on <laughs> yeah. TikTok. And they speak with confidence. Yeah. And I think these influencers have a huge yeah. following. The problem is they don't have the credentials to be talking about what they do. And when it comes to science, the credentials are so important because that education teaches you how to critically think as a scientist. Okay. And you're to be a researcher, you are deep in that field. You are not just reading chat GPT and you are not just yeah. reading blogs. You are reading the research. You are doing the research. You are in that field. You have that understanding. Yeah. And people are seeking information from podcasts where the people speaking on the topic have real, no expertise on the topic. But, and I don't necessarily think it's the people's problem who are seeking the information. They're hungry for knowledge. Students are hungry for knowledge. And reading the research paper isn't always accessible. Like you said, you know, the lay person, one, they can't get it because it's behind a paywall. Yeah. And two, they might not fully understand the content. So okay. they're hungry for the knowledge. And the people saying they're going to provide it aren't credible individuals. So where do you go? So it is a, it's a hard thing to do. Um, what I always suggest is just look for who is providing the information, look okay. for the expertise, look for evidence expertise. And by evidence expertise, I don't mean popular videos on YouTube. I don't mean they are a media person with lots of people following them because you can speak absolute rubbish and have a lot of people like what you say. Okay. That's not credentials. Are they a practice? That's the news. Yes. <laughs> yes. American news. <laughs> um, but are they a practitioner with evidence of expertise? Okay. Are they a scientist with research papers? Are they a professor? Are they someone with authority on the topic? And it doesn't necessarily have to be an academic. I know some amazing practitioners who don't have the formal education, but they have the credentials. So yeah. look for the credentials, look for the education, and look for the way they present their work. You know, if they present things that seem too good to be true, they give these really outrageous comments that if you do this, you're going to be expert at this. If you do this one workshop, you are going to be a master of this and an expert. Look for those kinds of outrageous comments. And whenever I see someone say, you're going to do this one day training, 
and you were going to be a fully qualified expert in this. I'm like, mm, yeah, that's not quite how learning works. Um, learning takes time. It's like my dad um, years ago, he wanted to go to hypnotherapy to stop smoking. And I said to him, okay, hypnotherapy is a very well evidenced practice. And he said, so, you know, we're going to do one session. And I said, okay, he's lying. Because for there to be any kind of result, it's got to take at least 10 sessions. Because the way the brain works is it needs to have consistent repeated input. It needs reinforcement. To consolidate, it needs repeated consolidation. Okay. You know, so if someone says you do this once and you're going to be an expert, that's just not how the brain works. So you can't be. That's not how people learn. So it, it definitely is div- difficult to navigate the environment, but that would be my biggest okay. uh, piece of advice. Look for the information and look for outrageous Do the clients. research. Do the and, research. And I'll give you some um, uh, some ideas as a layperson also. Make sure you have references. Yes. Right? When you're, when you're going to quote something, because if you have a reference, that means you actually have to go look it up, figure out yeah. where did this come from, you did the work. Uh, who said it, right? And then is there anything new? If I'm referencing something and it's like 1934, well, is there has there been anything new since then? Right. right. You know, like, right. so I need to go look at that. So if you don't have a reference or if you're like, I think I heard this somewhere, that's not good enough. It's not. I think I heard this somewhere. Right? That's People get away that, with that all the time, though. They, they do. Yeah. They do. I mean, look, I can go on TikTok and I can put on a white lab coat. And, and use the word psychology says or doctors say, and people will love everything I put out there. Yeah. Right? Just have a little charisma and be an outgoing person. I mean, you can do that. But that's, again, this is what kind of what happens today we see in this society is that people then fall for these things. Yeah. And it becomes where they repeat it so much that it almost becomes truth, even though it's not. It becomes like the accepted truth, even though it's not, because it's it, it, it just it got repeated too many times. Yeah. yeah and but, we know that. Honestly, I can't fix society. Here's what I can do. I can, yeah. I can take care of me, right? So my job is not to fix society. I'm not here to fix TikTok or the internet. For me and my people, my rule is we're going to write something. We have one scientist here, and that's Abby. So we're going to write something. We reference it. And we got to make sure that reference is is current and real. And that way, if if somebody does say, hey, this isn't right, like you have something wrong here, okay, great, please tell us, and we'll correct it. Yeah. Right. But at least if we have the reference, it shows that we took the effort to try to show that we were we were doing the research properly. Okay. Yeah, and the reference is important. You can't reference, reference a blog. A blog <laughs> is great. So I I think blogs are great for sharing information, but what they should do is they should be used as a platform for curiosity. Always check the information because I can say whatever I want in a blog. I yeah. run my own blog column and it's great. I, I love writing on it because I have freedom. Yeah. I don't have the freedom in academic papers as I do on the blog. Same with my books. I have freedom. But what I wouldn't want is anyone to read it and believe every single thing that I say without checking. That's why I yeah. always provide references for everything because it, it is up to you to check. And again, the references are the academic papers, are the actual research, not people quoting the research not more blogs on the research it's the actual research that's being done okay and, and this is where we differentiate a little bit because I'm, i think that's about science but i think we're talking about practical like what you do yeah when you're referencing something like you can reference my book you're not saying it's science you're just saying here's where i got this information yeah right yeah now, if i were to see that and i said oh he referenced my first book i'd be like hey dave listen that was like 15 years ago just some bad awesome. crap in that book Thank you. But there's some stuff that got really disproved in that book. I mean, there's some things that I wrote about that have been scientifically disproved. So okay. I, if you were referencing, I'd be like, hey, why don't you reference this newer one? Yeah. It's actually up to date on the science. Right. And that's what I would say to somebody. Or if if, I, if it was a competitor, right, and they were referencing something that old, I'd be like, man, they haven't done any research recently. Okay. I want to right. challenge this one a little bit. Yeah, I have please. a thing I show in one of my classes. Part of being the job doing the job of Scrum Master is you have to watch your team and try to understand what's going on. And there's a, a meeting that's happening, and there's one guy who's standing like this. And you know, I say, w- w- what do you notice? And I, well, he's very closed off because his arms are cl- crossed. And my understanding of that is that maybe – but maybe that's just how that guy stands and it's not really a thing, but everybody's been taught. It's not even that you would think to look it up, right? In the same yeah. way that you wouldn't look up like, oh, where did Jimmy Page steal that riff from? You wouldn't think, oh, I need to go figure out what that actually means. People just, it's like the Amy Cuddy thing. 
that stance. Everybody <laughs> just believes it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. that guy could have been that guy could have been cold. He could have it could have been his normal stance. He could have had a hurt back, and that was comfortable. Yeah. For him, right. There's a, there could be a million reasons why he was standing that way. So the way you can bet it by what you just did, what you said to that that person when he asked that question, he answered, and you you all you offered alternate options that could be truths. That helps people to, to critically think, like, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, maybe he is cold. So yeah. accepting that whatever you think you know might be wrong. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. there is there's always a saying in academia: the more you know, the less you know. <laughs> we realize that. Anytime you think you're an expert, the more expertise you have, the yeah. more you realize you just don't know anything. Okay. Humans are complicated. So when we're given these really simple answers, every time someone does this, it always means this, regardless of whether it's a relationship thing, a professional thing, or a body language thing. Yeah. If someone says every time you see this, it always means this, it's not true. We are yeah. way too complicated for anything to be consistent across the board. Now, that's not a nice practitioner answer because it doesn't make things simple. Yeah. But it also doesn't mean that you can't understand people. It just means you need to go out and dig a little bit deeper. You know, it, <laughs> it is up to us as individuals to go and learn. And it's not fun. It's not, well, I find it fun, but yeah. it's not always fun for everybody to go and do the research and go yeah. and do a bit of studying. And they say, well, how do I get around that? And I go, well, you're less effective at your job. That's how you get around that. Either you go and do the work and you do take the extra time to study and you do take that initiative or you let other people do it and let them get ahead. There is no shortcut to learning. There is no alternative yeah. way out. Either you're willing to put in a bit of extra work yeah. or you just you're irresponsible. You have that. Exactly. You are responsible for your own learning. Yeah. But as a leader, sometimes people need a little bit of direction. So providing, okay, here is where you can go. This is something you can do as a leader. Here are good resources. Okay. If anybody, you know, wants to take a course, let's see if we can fund some extra learning for you. Provide them some time in their schedule for study days. Yeah. Uh, I said to Chris when I came on here that um, I'm a scientist. I need to be up to date with the literature. And if I just consistently work and create, courses You're and do behind. these things are fall behind so i said i need one day every week that i can dedicate to just reading research and he said okay if that's what you need then that's what you do because i need to be able to be up to date and providing that opportunity is up for you up to you as the boss or the leader to say okay it might be difficult to find these resources and they might not know where to go but you have now provided them the opportunity yeah. take that learning and it's up to them whether they take it well i want to just interject one thing because what you just said is a really impactful thing for the people that are listening to this because you have to make space you you know enough about yeah. yourself to know to be good at my craft i need this space for myself and you felt you had the agency to ask for that and then chris understanding the value of this was willing to be like okay i think there's so many people that don't whether it's filling out a timesheet yeah. or studying their craft or getting, you know, whatever it is, they don't feel like it's okay to ask and they don't know that they should. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, um, and it wasn't that she had to do this. It wasn't that Abby had to do this, but there was a valid argument. It's like, you hired me so you can bring science into this field. For me to stay relevant with the science, I need to do X. So if I say no to that, then I'm, I'm basically saying, well, yeah, but, screw that. I just want you to use the science right. you already have, right? Yeah. Which would have been defeating the purpose of hiring a scientist right. to come aboard to bring science, right? So it's, the argument is it, you have to have a logical arg reasoning, right? It's yeah. not like she didn't come to me and say, I want you to pay me one day a week to just go read because I like reading. That would have been a different story, right? But she's like, I need to stay current on science because I'm yeah. falling behind. And if we quote something that is bad, it's bad for us in the science community. And I'm like, yeah, great. I love that. We don't want that to happen. So please take that day. Cool. Right. So, so it's it's how you present it too, right? Yeah. yeah. And that and that's I want to kind of segue into the books and the classes real quick. So that's how to present it, how to engage in that conversation. Yeah. That's stuff that they can learn from from the most recent book. But I know you've also got courses you're teaching in this stuff. So I want to give you a chance to to talk to the people that are hopefully have learned enough to know that they need to know more about this. Where can they learn more about it? 
Uh, well, our, our foundational class, foundational application of social engineering class, um, it's kind of funny. When I wrote that, I wrote it with a specific group in mind, which was my people from InfoSec. Uh, but what happened quickly, it, it turned into a class where I had teachers, I had salespeople, I had lawyers, I had doctors, I had psychologists. Uh, I taught that class for MI5, MI6, FBI. Like it's just like I've taught that class all around the globe because it didn't, it, it, it doesn't just cover social engineering from the aspect of what I do for a living. Right. It's really, how to communicate better class, right? And it's, Ooh, it's, um, that was how good. to learn how to communicate better and how to use all the aspects of report, influence, communication profiling, elicitation in becoming a master communicator. Okay. That class is something I would definitely promote. Um, Abby and I just worked together on putting out an audio only course that is all okay. about elicitation. And it is, um, the certification course for that has a bunch of quizzes and tests and, and it's, it's based on learning how to use elicitation for like negotiations and for everyday communications. And, oh, wow. you know, we, we do talk about social engineering a lot, but we, but you can, uh, we've had people come and take that class that have nothing to do with InfoSec at all. They're learning just how to, how to communicate better. Um, and then Abby and I have a workshop that we do. It's a live. We haven't done, put this online. And we have a workshop that we do between two and three hours that covers things like elicitation and detection deception. It has a couple really great exercises in it. Um, those are things that we do for private classes. We haven't, well, we ran that public once, but, and we might do that again, but um, we have a lot of organizations that want us to run that privately. Uh, so I, I, we have a lot yeah. more training, but I think for the, for your group, those are the ones that fit yeah. our other ones are very much geared towards red teams and things like that. Yeah. So those, those, um, those three seem to be really geared towards what it is that we do. That you awesome. do. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Abby, you want to plug your book as well? Cause it's coming out Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I have a new book coming out called Work in Progress, The Road to Empowerment and the Journey Through Shame. And it's a self-help book. And if you are interested in understanding yourself, becoming a better version of yourself, reaching empowerment and understanding how to be self-aware, it's a book that you want. All right. And, and I'll include a link to your TEDx talk. I love the thing that you said at the end of that talk about there's many different versions of you. Yes. That was really, really impactful. I mean, and, and everything you guys do. And you have a podcast. We do. Yes. There's, there's something else I want to promote for Abby. Yes. She, she, she forgets to do this. So um, I, I started a nonprofit six and a half years ago called the Innocent Lives Foundation. And uh, our, our mission is to help geolocate people who traffic children and create child abuse material. Um, and we've been at it for six and a half years. We've um, helped with 518 cases so far. Wow. Um, Dr. Abby's joined that cause, uh, I think a year and a half or so ago, and uh, she has a book coming out that's being published by Morgan James mm. that will be coming out soon. That is a book for children on how to help them learn like to say no to bad things wow. like being asked, to empower them with that, all about Lily the, the Lion. And it's, a, it's, Lily, an amazing, it's, awesome. it's an amazing book. I had a chance to see it. It's really wonderful. Um, and it will be, I don't know the exact date of publishing, but... Uh, we got everything in the works. She's well, already whatever written. it does, let me know, and I'll, and I'll yeah. put it back up. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a really, really great book, and we're going to have uh, some things at the end for parents' resources where they can get some QR codes and then be able to go to our website and get some resources to how to talk to their kids about these things and how to help their kids understand the dangers of the Internet. I'm okay. uh, really trying to make it like a workbook for kids and for parents to help them with that. Yeah. But, and she if always you forgets to promote herself with that, and it's awesome. I know, I, I forget. But if you are interested in having that book or being um, informed when it comes out, then please drop us your email, and we'll make sure that when we do have a release date and a pre-order yeah. date, we get that to you. Okay. So I'm going to include links to the website, classes, Innocent Lives, the books, and I will tell the people that are listening or watching that if you go to their website and you write to them, they actually write back <laughs> yes. or LinkedIn. I couldn't believe it. I was totally freaked out by that, but I am. Um, is there any other contact information they should have? Is LinkedIn and your website um, enough? LinkedIn is, is the best and the website of the best ones. That's where we're most active. You know, right. I, I really appreciate you saying that, but I tell you for, for me um, coming up in this industry, I had the privilege of some really amazing people taking time to help me. Right. Like one of my first mentors was Paul Ekman. I got to write that book with him and he took like two years of his life to work wow. on writing that book. Um, that was an amazing, like, why did he do that? Like I'm a nobody. Right. And he, he like, he's, <laughs> he's like one of the world's most leading psychologists in the history of mankind. And yeah. And he took time to work with me. Right. For the, for the last four or so years, one of my close mentors has been Joe Navarro. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it like, so when, 
I look at that and I go like, who am I to not answer a simple message that you sent? You know, I mean, you just, you wanted to talk. I mean, why not just have a conversation? I, because for, for all your work, but, but well, what you just brought you. Up, I mean, the stuff that you do with, with Joe Navarro, Robin Drake, the, the interview, I watched the interview with Chris Voss the other day, like most of the people they'll, they'll have heard of these people or you can watch the videos. Like I watched the one Dr. Abby that, that you did where you were looking at the couples trying to figure out how long they've been together. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, the work that you do is super impactful to me, Thank and, and I, I appreciate you taking time and for Thank doing you. this. And hopefully, for the folks listening and watching, this has excited them enough that they'll reach out too. And I hope it helps them. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having us. If you learn to work the old way, but the new way is what you need. Now.